today and tomorrow. I just want to do a few housekeeping items before Zach comes up to introduce our speaker today. Um, if you haven't gotten one of these cards yet, it's a feedback card. Um, and at the end of each day, we'll be drawing um, for our t-shirt winners. Um, so definitely put your email on there, and we'll tell you the way that you can come pick it up in the uh, marketing um, office room. Um, don't fill out more than one, because we need to be disqualified. So uh, make sure you leave a comment to be actually entered to when you have to leave a comment um, to let us know. These are what we use to actually hear your feedback, to know um, what you liked about the speaker, uh, what can be improved upon, and just to get your general feedback for the tech forums in the future. So definitely fill those out. Um, if you guys haven't gotten a schedule, they're out on that table out there. Um, just make sure uh, you check that over. There's the career fair obviously going on today. There's a lock picking building being set up right now uh, with Austin Apple. It's going to be awesome. Um, also the portrait platoon. And then there's the international festival tonight. Um, it's going to be all ninja out. So um, without further ado, here's Zach to introduce our speaker. Okay. Wow, I'm pretty sure I just heard that. <laughs> <laughs> that was Alex. All right. Uh, what's up, guys? My name is Zach Snyder. I am the Public Relations Chair for UAT. Uh, I just want to introduce our first speaker for Spring 2012 Tech Forum. Uh, the first guy we've got, his name is Tamir Nadav. He is a game designer and programmer, uh, valedictorian graduate from Full Sail University. And he's been working, like, he was working in MMOs for six years with uh, Visual. And uh, right now, he's working for Playdom, who is part of Disney Interactive. So, without further ado, I present Mir Nadav. I just uh, found that we have these, these cool little clicky thingies, and I've always wanted one, because you know, I, I feel like I should be in a suit while I have these, but um, they're pretty cool, you know, the little button things. I never get to play with them before. So, uh, my talk today is essentially why social games are awesome. I know probably people in this room have some fairly strong feelings about social games these days, and since I work in it, I figure it's a good way to try and break the ice and hopefully not get stabbed on the way out. Um, so I wanted to put up a couple of reasons of, of why you should even you know, be here and, and pay any attention to me. So number one, I've been in the industry for over eight years. Um, like uh, Zach said, I've worked on pretty much every type of platform there is. MMOs, PC games, console games, mobile games, and now into the social space. I graduated from Full Sail, so I went to a gaming college with a gaming program just like you guys did. I graduated in 2005 as a programmer. I am here uh, as an advisory board member on, at UAT with the gaming program. I've been affiliated with the school now for about five, six years, something like that. Um, I've been going to these different trade shows, volunteering, attending, and even doing some speaking at uh, the Game Developer Conference and the Game Developer Conference online in Austin, Texas. I'm one of the founding members of Women in Games International. Uh, somebody actually took this a little bit too far when they were interviewing me, and in a book, I, they talk about my struggles as a female programmer in the games industry. <laughs> that would be a struggle. Yeah, well, you know, it's the hair. <laughs> I know over 2,000 people inside the games industry professionals, so this ranges from junior entry-level people, contractors, all the way up to CEOs, presidents, and owners of some of the bigger game companies that are out there. I've placed in the industry, either directly or indirectly through contacts and networking, over 300 people trying to break into the games industry. And I have really awesome hair. <laughs> So let's talk a bit about the birth of social gaming. It's a very relatively new space in gaming as a whole, which is also a relatively new space. But 2003, the birth of MySpace. <coughs> Late 2004, the birth of Facebook. And MySpace starts to slowly die. <laughs> 2008, social media industry revenue hits about $10 million. So you're looking at about a five-year span. You know, that's a pretty average growth. It's a little bit slow, but it's enough to slightly be noticed. 2009, Zynga releases Farmville. Facebook hits 100 million active users. Three, less than three years later, the social media industry revenue hits $7 billion. The amount of growth in literally less than three years has not been seen before. This is a, an exploding market, and there is obviously ridiculous amounts of money in this. And that's what it looks like. 
Uh, that's not my garage, it's you know, a couple of my friends. And so let's talk a little bit about game creation. Uh, this is a great quote by Shigeru Miyamoto. Um, remember that you're not the only one playing games these days anymore. People older than us, are, our parents, our grandparents are playing games as well. And something that I tend to hear a lot when I talk to people talking about game development is, I want to make my own game that has flying dolphins with laser eyes and players can create their own clothing thread by thread that's on the cloud and I can do it in six weeks. No, you can't. <laughs> but I can tell you how to make an MMO in four easy steps. Number one, find at least 200 talented people. <laughs> Work hard for about three, three to four years, some up to six and seven years now. Crunch for periods of months, sometimes years, and spend about $80 million. If you can do those things, you can make a successful MMO. But that's generally what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> what about a AAA console game? Find about 100 talented people. This is also starting to climb towards the 200 plus range. Work for about two years. This is now starting to move towards three and four years for some of the bigger console titles. Crunch for periods of months. This is also starting to stretch into years and spend about $30 million. If you can do that, you can make a AAA title. AAA title console market tends to be very competitive and so because of that, that is a fairly good representation of the working conditions. <laughs> As many of you have probably heard, things can be tough. So social can't really be much better than that, can it? Find 20 people. We can probably make four social games with the people in the room right now. Now I'm totally overestimating, uh, trying to make it sound like I have a lot more audience than I do. But we could probably make at least two successful social games in here. Work for six to nine months. Crunch for periods of days. Um, I think the most I've crunched while working in the social space was a week. Spend $1 million. By comparison, that's pretty easy. <laughs> So let's look at some of the numbers. Something I hear often is the best video games will obviously earn the most money, period. And by that logic, Justin Bieber is the best musician out there and Twilight is the best book series that has ever been written. <laughs> Owned. Project Reach. So some of the top MMOs, they have about a million monthly active users. WoW was the first one to actually break a million users and is, you know, a fairly um, abnormal situation. It hit 13 million and it's slowly decreasing now. Um, maybe one to two a year will come out. So Star Wars, Star Wars also currently is over a million users, but most MMOs prior to that were in the 200 to 500,000 uh, thousand user range. Top console and PC titles, they sell about three to four million cop, uh, sales um, for the really top quality ones. There's maybe five to 10 of these a year out of all the ones that come out. And the top social games have average about six to nine million users, uh, or sorry, six to nine million monthly active users. Cityville hit 100 million users in one month. And about 20 to 30 of these types of games come out every year that make this, uh, that hit these metrics. So is it worth it? Top console games, the ones that you know are, are hitting over the basically essentially going platinum, the ones over a million user or a million sales, um, will make around seventy million dollars. And when you compare that to the cost it takes to make them, that's not such a great return. Most titles do not sell over a million copies. In fact, I looked at a list uh, last night, and it turns out that out of all the games that have ever come out on the PS3, only twenty have broken a million sales. Uh, Xbox, I believe, is about 26 to 30. So, you know, it's, it's fairly hard to, to actually make the money back that you put into these. MMOs, uh, with the exception again of World of Warcraft and, and hopefully Star Wars, because I'm playing it, make an average of about 85 million over their entire lifetime, which is about the cost it takes to make one. And most of these MMOs are not breaking even. They're switching now to different financial models like DDO, uh, Lotro are now going more into the free-to-play, um, monetizing in small bits, so microtransactions, and this is the way they're trying to break out of this problem that all these MMOs have had. Top social games make $20 million over their lifetime. So what does that mean for their numbers? A 2,000% return of their investment. So I spent $1 million to make one, I got $20 million back, that's a pretty good return. So let's look at the cost-benefit analysis of that. 
one MMO, if I want to make an MMO, instead I can make 80 social games. If five succeed to the level that I mentioned before, I've already made enough money to cover everything. Let's say I want to do, instead of a PC game, some social games. I can make 30 for the same cost. And only two need to be successful for me to have enough money to continue my business. Some extra employment benefits within the social space. <clears throat> With multiple projects in the works by these larger companies that are making these games, comes stability. And this works because as one project starts to ramp down, another one is ramping up. Whereas traditionally in the games industry, as a project goes live and ships in one way or another, then there's these rounds of layoffs because they don't need all those people anymore. Then later they start ramping up another project, they hire more people back, they do a lot of contracting, and so it makes it very difficult to hold a position for a long period of time. But if you've got a company that has 10 to 15 social games in the works at all times, it means that instead of people um, being hired and fired, People are simply moving between these projects as the project dictates. And you have this excellent source of knowledge as people are working on these different types of social games, working together in different groups to share all the things that they've learned, which makes it much more stable, much more fun, and adds a lot more variety for people who are always looking for something new to do. So let's talk about your mama. <laughs> Our target demographic tends to be in the 35 to 65 year old female range. She's looking at, for a way to connect with her peers. She is constantly stressed. So, you know, the, the, the main demographic that we're looking for are the, the stay-at-home mothers who are managing the household, managing the children, just, you know, all over the place. There's nothing good on TV. They feel bored. They don't feel like they have a way to get out and relax or to um, essentially get a distraction from their life. And they have a lot of money that they don't know what to do with. That's kind of how we see. So let's talk a little bit about some of the feedback we heard. I took this picture at GDC this year because I thought it was hysterical. Um, I don't think he quite knew what he was trying to say, but it was pretty awesome. So some of the things I've heard can be summarized in that statement at the bottom. You stupid developers don't know good game design from a rotten turnip, and you just try to suck money from innocent people, now repent, you sinners. Number one, you're killing real games. Well, that's not true. When you think of games, outside of the, uh, the console market that you're familiar with, how many of them are non-social? I can think of solitaire. But other than that, books, um, sorry, you know, pen and paper games, card games, board games, um, elementary school games, all games are social. So in fact, the console market that we're used to is actually the anomaly. Video games started socially. They started in the arcade. People started playing, um, you know, when you, when you recall fondly your childhood memories of playing Street Fighter II at the arcade, Gauntlet Legends, all these games that you're playing with a lot of people. How many people remember the uh, eight-player X-Men game that, uh, that used to be out there? Social game, playing with friends, peer pressure, monetization, all the vectors that you see in social games on Facebook were in that one machine. And we have very positive memories of that but seem to be very critical about playing it online. Family computer, the original Nintendo, was the Nintendo Family Entertainment System, the Famicom. It was designed for a system to be played at home so that you and your family can play games together. And lastly, solo games are still releasing with the same or better frequency. So just because the social market is exploding doesn't mean that PC and console games are slowing down. In fact, they're speeding up just as much. <laughs> or sorry, not just as much, but they are continuing to speed up on the, on the uh, growth that they've had over the past few years. There are more PC games coming out, there are more console games coming out, and they still target the same demographic as they did before. That, as a pinball machine, is actually the birthplace of quests in video games. Because if you remember, you had an object that you would have to hit with your pinball, and when you do, it would give you an objective of hit five others of these same um, pieces. And when you would knock them all down, you would then hit the original pin that you did before. And it would open a new area for your ball to go through and earn a whole bunch more points and rewards. So essentially, this is the birthplace of modern quests and video games. So social games are not real games. Well, a game is a form of player sport, especially a competitive one, but played according to rules decided by skill, strength, or luck. 
And there's a lot of that in essentially all the social games we have. If you look even at Farmville, you start to learn and have to balance your timers. You have to spend a lot of time managing your farm, making sure everything doesn't wilt, making sure that you're getting all the ingredients that you need to keep everything alive, and so this is a game. The target demographic tends to share similar opinions about the games that we play on our consoles. So a lot of times if you ask people in the tar target demographic, their response is, oh, those aren't games. They're just mindless shooting. They're mindless killing. I don't even understand them. But these, they really tend to enjoy. And so if you ask people, all the hundreds of millions of users who are playing these social games, they have an absolute wonderful time playing them. They think it's a deep, enriching story. They absolutely love getting into it. And they're having fun. They enjoy them. They also don't need the type of depth and complexity that we've been putting in some of our console games. Like if you look at, say, you know, the Final Fantasy series or um, even you know, EVE Online, which I consider an incredibly um, com complex game. We, we don't need that in the social space. They're meant to just simply be enjoyed and people are able to do this in a casual way. People complain that these games are way too easy. Well, the purpose of social games is not to win not to be you know, the absolute best, complete the project and move on, but to enjoy the world that you're in. Because of this, you enjoy the experience rather than the victory. You like coming and playing every day because you like the world that, the theme that was presented to you and the world that you've created around you. And this is the definition of true user-generated content. So and we, we give players a world, so a farm or a frontier or a city, and they create the world around them and the stories that happen to the people, how the city is built, and these absolutely thrive. In fact, this was uh, the main reason why The Sims absolutely exploded. It was originally targeted towards the same demographic of 25 to 40 year old males. And all of a sudden they noticed that women started playing it and then the amount of copies that were sold just absolutely exploded. And people were using these to tell stories of their life. They were placing their real neighbors inside the Sims and interacting with them and creating these different stories and dynamics and it's just absolutely massive. And that's, that's what these games are about. So there's a complaint that all social games are copies of each other. So yes, many of them are iterative rather than creative. There is a lot of similarities and there are in fact straight up copies of different social games that are out there and it happens. Well it also happens everywhere else. There are, if you look at the amount of FPS's, you look at the amount of racing games, there are very small differences between the two. Maybe instead of being in an alien planet, you are now underwater or so you can tell how many uh, you know, shooter games I play. Or there's a zombie apocalypse, but you're, you're killing you know, things that are coming at you. They're, they're so ridiculously similar, and it's, it's the same everywhere. It's not unique to social games. So you know, MMOs tend to be you know, very iterative based off of each other. Um, racing games, action-adventure games, they, they have so much in common, and so the mechanics are essentially copied or borrowed or iterated on rather than you know, coming out with absolutely new innovation. And it's just the way that things work. People find what, what people are enjoying, it becomes a trend, and games or other media gets developed specifically for that. So to say that this is something that specifically happens in social media is not true. And even outside of games, this applies to all different types of media. So books are, uh, there are so many book series that are copies of each other. There's, I think, like eight or nine different book series now that are essentially Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings um, that come out comics, film, plays, music, anything that has a creative backing has in one way or another followed this exact same trend that there are so many iterative works, there are copies of works, and then occasionally something new and innovative comes out. And those are the things that tend to explode. Virals. Everyone hates getting spammed by virals. They are evil and horrible. Well, that's not true. You don't like them, but your mother does. The target demographic has shown time and time again that they actually really enjoy this feature. Most Facebook players within this demographic, they feel it's helpful, they feel it's encouraging, they feel like they're connected with their peers. They're, having, they're actually engaging with them. They're, they're being a part of each other's lives and entertainment and enriching the experience for all of them together. 
they get to share their bonuses with their friends so they feel like you know they've accomplished something and everyone gets to hear about it they show off all the cool things they've done oh look i completed this quest i now have a Christmas tree with a menorah on the top and fireworks going off and look how awesome this stuff is <laughs> and everyone gets to enjoy it it's, it looks you know it looks fantastic it's fun and they you know again they help each other out they they you know they really feel like they're connecting with each other and 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 assisting everyone in essentially having a good time it's cooperative gameplay as opposed to competitive gameplay over 10 million gifts are sent every day, and these are sent without any prompting. We are not forcing players to send this. We give them the opportunity to send gifts to their friends, and that is how popular it is. 10 million a day um, get sent out. So to kind of put everything back together, um, I hope I, I've explained a little bit more that, uh, that maybe these games are, are not specifically for, for us in the same traditional way that we're used to, but it is a very viable market to have. It's extremely um, successful and it doesn't mean that all the games that we know and love are going to be going away. So these are the things I would like you to keep in mind. You can now play games with your family. There are so many times I remember in my childhood where I really wish my mom would understand what the heck Mario was trying to do. And although half the fun might have been watching her just completely die on every single Goomba she saw. But, um, but the fact is now, you know, our, our parents are on Facebook, and, and yes, I understand that can be creepy, but um, we get to interact with them. It's, and if you look at it in this way, it's actually kind of fun. I, I love the fact that I can now play a game or, or even play a game with my mother that I have worked on, and she gets to enjoy it in a way that I never thought she would enjoy video games. I've seen her try to play racing games, and that makes me never want to get in the car with her again. <laughs> Step outside your comfort zone. You know, we're, we're used to the competitive FPSs, the competitive um, fighting games, the um, competitive shooter games, all this, this PvP, and these are the things that we, we know and that we grew up with. But again, remember that this is, this is not the norm. This was a very different method of gaming that emerged. And it's good to try something new and to try to play it with an open mind. And hopefully you'll find that it's actually an enjoyable experience if you, if you kind of break away from, from your, your you know, uh, style of, of thinking at the moment. Um, the sad news is that I, I wish this wasn't the case, as most game developers do. But in order for me to continue to make games, I have to make enough money making it to make another one. And so when in social games, the monetization vectors tend to be a little bit more exposed to people, and that can be seen as a backlash in the same way that DLC was seen as a backlash. Um, we, we have to do this in order to guarantee that we can continue to make games. And believe me, we want to find the best way of making money without annoying our players or, or doing anything to in any way, shape, or form upset people, but we have to guarantee that we make enough money to then make more games that you guys enjoy. And lastly, because the social space is so new, and this is probably the most important point, there is so much room right now for innovation. Um, the market, two years old. We've seen progression from Farmville all the way up to what I'm going to show you in a minute, which is one of my favorite Playdom games that came out a month ago. And the difference is extremely vast, which means that there's so much room to grow, and there's so much more that can be done inside this space. So I'm going to shamelessly plug a Disney and Playdom project. How many people are familiar with the Marvel Avengers Alliance game that released recently? Not that many. Oh, good, so I can pimp this. <laughs> um, again, remember that just two years prior to this, we were, playing, we were playing Farmville. And hopefully this works, and I didn't break something. Did I break something? Oh, I broke everything. <laughs> My presentation is so powerful it shut down the computer. Ah, okay. Oh, is there audio? Yeah. Ah, nope. Gimme. Is there a way to turn it up? Oh, no. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'll pause it. I'll pause it. Okay. Under siege. A mysterious force is attracting supervillains and making them stronger than ever. Welcome to 
shield, the planet's last line of defense against superhuman aggressors. Recruit and command the most powerful team of Avengers ever assembled. Take on the most notorious supervillains in epic head-to-head -head showdowns. Greatest shield agent of all time. Marvel Avengers Alliance. Coming soon, only on Facebook. Where are my Final Fantasy fans? Oh, we're a dying breed, aren't we? <laughs> Uh, for those of you who remember the you know traditional style of creating a party, going out and uh, leveling up, fighting things, the traditional role-playing games from you know the early Nintendo game, this is actually very similar to that, with the exception that instead of white mage, black mage, and black belt, you get to control all the different Avengers and beat up all the people, um, all, you know, Doctor Doom and all the other uh, famous Marvel villains, and there's a lot of depth, complexity, and this game is absolutely exploding now. It, it just came out about a month ago, and it is proving that games do not have to be as simple as the types of things we remember from just two years ago seeing on Facebook. And again, this, this just shows how, how far we can go in this space and make amazing things. So if you haven't checked this out, I highly recommend it. I'm super addicted and, and even though I you know, work for the same company and that this is a, a Disney IP, um, I actually find it to be incredibly engaging and, and have really enjoyed it. So um, essentially that's uh, my presentation. So um, feel free to bother me with questions, tell me why you, you disagree. I, I love proving people wrong. Um, and yeah, I'm here as a resource. The last thing that I will point out is that I, I put my email address on the bottom for a very specific reason. As someone who is working with UAT, one of the things that I have a passion with, like I mentioned before, is working with people and helping them get their foot in the door inside the games industry. And you will not have a chance like this again, where someone in the industry is purposefully giving you their contact information and asking you to connect with them. So I tell everyone who sees my email address, you have one week to send me an email, and that shows me that you actually have a strong passion for trying to get in the industry. And once you make a connection with me, I will do what I can to help you guys find your jobs and, and, and help you guys get into the industry. I'm here as a resource for all of you. So. All right, um, let's go ahead and I guess start taking some questions. So let me start with you. Um, oh, and tell, tell me your name uh, when you ask. All right, so my name's Tyler, and uh, okay. my question is, all of your slides went over AAA, went over MMO. You didn't cover anything mobile. Um, and mobile's been reaching the same level of escalation as social has. Correct. We've kind of been doing it in parallel. Yes. And now we're seeing a lot of crossover between the two. So do you feel, as your role at Playdom, that through Playdom and through the other social game space, that there's going to be this kind of almost merging of mobile and social into this unified kind of casual social experience? The reason I didn't mention it is because, in my opinion, it already happened. Um, mobile gaming, when it started in America, was very low-key. It wasn't anywhere near where it was in you know the Asian market that has a much better bandwidth and all. But when the American mobile market started to explode, it essentially went directly to starting to do the exact same thing as social media. And so um, while the numbers I was showing were specifically targeted for uh, online Facebook games, mobile is doing, like you said, is doing the same thing and in my opinion have already merged. Um, in fact, many of the games you play on Facebook also have a way of interacting with the same data from a mobile device, sometimes an exact port and sometimes interacting in a new and optimized way. And that that shows me that, you know, the, it, I mean, it, it's essentially waiting to happen and now is, is absolutely exploding. I love the fact that I can, I can connect the data on my computer, you know, on, on Facebook, or I can log in on my phone and do things. Um, in fact, that, that's also merging with console games. There's, there's just this big amalgamation of, oh, maybe we should connect people again, you know. Wasn't it great to play games together with, you know, three people next to you playing video games? And now, I can't do that. I can't play um, I can't play Halo with people next to me. I have to, you know, have four consoles and play with people who aren't in my house. But with all the emergent stuff that's happening with social, like, uh, for example, Star Wars The Old Republic, the 
there is plans to take the um, the crafting and skill system and migrate it to the phone since it uses social mechanics of timers. So um, I'll be able to interact with Star Wars from my phone differently than how I interact with it on the PC. So I know that's a few tangents completely outside of the, the bounds of your question, but I do think that they are um, absolutely already merged and are just continuing to strengthen each other. So I hope that answers your question. Let me go to you. I know this isn't specifically your job, but how does, uh, I guess, play to plan to innovate in how social games are monetized? Uh, that would be a trade secret. Um, <laughs> what I will say is that um, we are constantly looking for new ways to expand past things that are tried and true. So there's a lot of, one, one of the advantages that I didn't mention in the presentation is that in social games, we have a ridiculous amount of data about the people who play our game. Um, MMOs sort of do, but because of the amount of data that's coming in, they don't quite have the level of, of uh, um, the, the finer detail of data tracking that we have in, in the social space. So we are always um, testing and trying new methods to improve both in terms of coming up with new game styles and game plans as well as um, coming up with new and innovative ways uh, to, to make money. And because of the fact that we have projects in the works at all times, as uh, a few projects come out that, that make a lot of money, we then have leeway to start taking bigger risks with other projects. And we're doing it all the time. There are, there are projects at all the, the bigger social media companies that um, don't get launched because they'll we'll try something extremely risky, we'll work on it for a while, we'll test it in a few small areas, um, either geographically or with a, a small beta group or alpha group, and we'll watch the numbers and see what happens. And if the market shows that it's just not you know, it's not interested in this, then all right, we'll can that project and work on another one. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's, we're always looking for that. And um, so I think the innovation and the risk with that comes both in terms of new styles of gameplay and new ways of monetizing. Uh, let's go here. Um, so when I think about movies, I think about movies. Name. Oh, I'm Tristan. Uh, Tristan, yeah, okay. Tristan. Um, so when I think about movies, I think about movies as being kind of an inherently social experience, and that's kind of their success. Like, you can watch movies by yourself, but almost rare. rarely do you actually do that. Like, most people watch them with friends or family. Oh, I watch them with a bucket of ice cream and, you? You know, okay. and a tissue box. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, like, um, Not for that, so... Okay. <laughs> what, what's funny, though, is that video games that are being more cinematic seem to be completely missing that kind of marketability to social and family groups like and I was wondering if you had any thoughts or like ideas of ways that that could be bridged using still a cinematic experience but not necessarily like a murdering spree experience that sure. games are right now um, I can think of two good examples to to talk about um, your question and so one would be the cutscenes in Metal Gear Solid 4 which I remember one being 35 minutes, yeah. I can save, and then another one for 25 minutes. Um, that is a cinematic experience, and that is um, purely so, and designed essentially for one person to, to play an experience, because it's not a multiplayer game. And then, and I, I hate to use the same game twice, because I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm you know, trying to, to show it off, but the Old Republic, the cutscenes are interactive. And so when I talk to a character, I get to pick dialogue choices. When I'm playing with my wife, we both pick dialogue choices and roll to see who, which one goes. And, and that, to me, is a lot more social. Um, I would also argue that, well, this might be me, but I think it's a lot of people, that when you watch movies, you don't interact with the people around you. Um, I, I tend to punch people who talk during movies. <laughs> so. Um, uh, and so for some people it's different and for those people, you know, watching a movie can, you know, um, is an enjoyable experience because the experience is not broken up by gameplay. Right. Um, so whereas with Metal Gear Solid, you know, I, I play and then I watch and then I play and then I watch and you can't really do that with multiple people. But with online games, um, they'll have a lot more of the interactive cinematics so I'm either constantly playing or I'm, I'm watching the intro together. And so you, you, get, uh, you get a lot more of the social interaction in that way. Is that the answer? Um, well, have you seen Journey? Have I? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I, I have not. Oh, God. I'm going to get thrown off stage. I have not played it yet. Okay. But I'm, I'm dying to. It looks, it looks absolutely beautiful. 
It's kind of interesting because there's no cutscenes or anything like that, but you have the ability to jump into a game where there's another player involved, and you can kind of crisscross paths. And it's yeah. really interesting about how they can bring more people into playing a game without necessarily having like cutscenes, but still having a cinematic experience. Yeah, and there's, I mean, and that's happening in in all um, areas of of game development as well. So it's it's not just yeah. an Xbox downloadable game. That's that's also happening in social games. So like on Facebook, you're seeing um, synchronous play, where when you visit someone's uh, neighborhood that you can see them walking around and you guys can walk around and even chat and you know some games are starting to have things like guilds and, and it's yeah. so it everything that we know and love from the games we play now is is going in the in the social direction so we'll go to uh, no problem any hands in this section because I haven't gotten anyone they're sitting in the dark they're fine okay uh, <laughs> good uh, my name is chef uh, chef you, Jeff. oh Jeff okay <laughs> 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 yeah, I should just do Hefe, that's easier. Uh, anyway, so I noticed when you were going through the numbers, you were speaking about MMOs, but you were looking more towards the uh, AAA ones. Do you find the economics, uh, in-game economics, or the actual you know, uh, financials of ones that have been built around microtransactions as opposed to the ones that are going to I'd be looking towards I personally play Forsaken World. Nice. For Perfect World. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to DCUO, which went to right. uh, that. Do you find the ones that have been built around the microtransactions maybe are uh, financially getting closer to more stable? Get through social games? Sure. Um, so I would say. I would say yes, although that that is a very relatively new thing in America. Um, most, like you mentioned, most of the games we know are ones that started out the other way and have migrated that way. DDO is actually doing a really good job of doing it. Yeah. Um, but the thing to point out is that these MMOs, as they're being built from the ground up to be microtransaction systems, um, are essentially social media games without the Facebook backing. So they are moving towards um, the things that work in social media. Um, that being said, there are a number of them that come out all the time. Um, in fact, I'm playing one from Russia right now called Allods, uh, which is actually really neat. It looks like WoW, but there's like 130 classes, and it's it's gorgeous and fun, and it's uh, you know microtransaction system. And in fact, you can actually grind the hard currency, so you literally don't have to spend a dime if you want to get everything in the game. But it speeds it up greatly, and the, I find that these games tend to come out. Um, you know, all the time, and they'll be up for a year or two, and then they'll shut down, and then a new one com will come out. And what they're doing, in a, in a sense, is they're building an engine, and they're throwing a game on top of it for a very low cost, putting it out there, getting people to enjoy a fresh new experience, and when that starts to taper down, they, they close it, change the art, and change the, the story, keep most of the mechanics the same and re-release it and now it's something new and fresh and exciting and, and they get that huge initial wave of upfront um, paying customers and, and follow that trend. So, you know, in essence, these, these games are making enough because of how, how inexpensive they are to produce to more than cover their worth and then continue on with that, with that model. So, but the ones that are being built here now are, are really more starting to follow the successful trends that have happened inside the social space. Okay. Cool. All right. Maverick right. uh, so in a market where we've got more and more of these games being successful and so more and more of them are being made, what are some of the main things you can do to get someone's attention and get them to play your game for the first time? Um, that is tricky. Um, the, the problem with an exploding wave is, is just that, how to, how to get the attention. I mean, it's the same thing that's happening on Kickstarter right now. You know, we see one game developer make $3.3 .3 million in a month, and um, we, we try to do the same thing, but unfortunately we're not Tim Schafer and, and do not quite have that ability. The, the trick, in my opinion, if you want to get noticed as a, a very small company, is to, um, is to make something that's similar enough to people's play experience with enough uniqueness to keep people. Um, the most important thing for uh, a very beginning social game, in my opinion, would be to keep people. Because then you can slowly grow your user base. And because you, you simply can't compete in the, you know, the initial burst. You, you can't compete with the marketing machines of, of the, the bigger companies. You can't spend, you know, um, you know, half of that budget goes into mar you know, um, marketing that, that first two weeks of showing off the new game to everybody. 
And so if you can make a successful game that people stick around with, it gives you the time that you need to build up revenue as well as to trickle and grow. And we're starting to find that um, games that have a really good um, a really good way of keeping players engaged and connecting players with each other are ones that will last a long time and will essentially advertise for themselves as they go. But it, it's difficult. I mean, it's it's difficult in every space. So you know, whenever something is exploding, it you know, how do you be the one that shines out? So uh, let's go up front. Eric, um, so I was just curious what you think okay. uh, are the tools and resources that would be suggested for an independent developer in so, uh, making social games? Um, well, the one that's being used the most is Flash at the moment, um, but that's expensive. HTML5 is starting to take form, and that's a lot less expensive. In fact, I believe it's free, which is a great thing. So you can develop there. You can also develop the, the older social games that were built on PHP and Java and things like that are also, there's, if you make a good game, are still just as viable. So um, I would suggest if you're concerned about that type of thing, start with something with the, the lowest um, you know, upfront cost to allow you to make something. And if it does well, then you have the funds to, to move on. But if, if HTML5 happens to take off, you've got you know, essentially $600 less that you have to spend up front to, per person in, in your company to cover the development of a social game in Flash. Um, and I'm, I'm a huge thing of saving money. I mean, that's... <laughs> so, all right, go ahead. Michael Jordan? Yes. Okay. Gordon. Oh, Gordon, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, in the last decade or so, um, games have been focusing on increased backwards. Uh, I believe that the um, increased backwards in animation, I, I believe it's starting to reach its peak. And this new, um, this new genre not focusing more on that, they focus more on community, uh, uh, friends-based. Uh, what do you think uh, the trend is going on uh, to? Uh, do you think uh, they're going to, uh, in the next couple of years, games going to be working on, on, on focusing on less of graphics and more on community, or uh, where do you think uh, they're going to be more focused? Uh, no, I, I think it... <laughs> um, <laughs> Sure. Um, I think it depends on the space. I think in social space, there's still, you know, obviously room to grow graphically. Um, as connections get better, um, and, and as people are, are more connected, as cloud services start, you know, kicking in, and the the you know the containers change. Um, Flash tends to be really memory intensive, so there's a lot we can't do. But now Unity is starting to explode. I think the space will see graphical growth moving towards traditional gaming right now. In fact, I, I was talking to somebody. I mean, if someone would essentially stick like on live inside of a Facebook game, you, you've got, uh, you know, you, I can now play Bioshock in Facebook. Um, I don't know how cool that is, but it's pretty cool, I think. Um, I don't think that graphics have quite reached their peak. I think that the, the specific quality of art um, doesn't have much room to grow, but it's increasing very slowly. What is still growing, though, is, optim is optimization and performance. So being able to have a lot more high-polished art animating and moving around the screen will continue to grow in, um, in the console and PC market and, and as well on, in the social space. But because people are realizing that um, the, the concept of diminishing returns, essentially, so that it takes more money to make less improvement now when we're working on art or graphics or um, you know, complexity and things like that within that space. And so it's now a lot cheaper to start moving more towards different, um, essentially what's happening right now in social media. Like, oh, we can, if we add in these features allowing people to connect with each other, this dramatically improves the game performance as a and costs a lot less as opposed to our graphics are just slightly better than the competitors. And so I think people are now looking more towards, uh, whereas before they were, they were moving kind of in a straight line of better performance, better graphics. Um, now they're trying to expand into all different areas of, okay, let's, let's add this to the game that, that isn't there before. Let's allow more connectivity with other people. And I would say over the next decade, um, I, 
I can predict that um, social interaction will be a big component of a lot of the ways that games are developing, but I'm sure that's not all. And I can't begin to predict what else will come up that all of a sudden games will start to do. I mean, if you see how much has changed just in two years, another 10 is, is just completely mind-blowing. I mean, I'll, I'll be probably playing games on my toothbrush for all I know, you know. So, <laughs> it's a, there, there was a great comic I remember reading about somebody, co somebody arguing through a cereal box um, because he reached an achievement he shouldn't have because he had a modded cereal bowl. Um, <laughs> it, just, it was awesome because I was looking at the going, oh my god, that's totally going to happen. You know, the last, like my, my shirt will start beeping at me if it's been like two days since it's been washed and think, I mean, it's, it's, the technology is going to explode and it'll, it'll probably be to the point where it starts getting pretty creepy. If, if it hasn't already, like I said, you know, my mom is on Facebook looking at, <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, so I, I think social is going to be the, the next big, you know, huge, huge wave of, of where all these different types of games are going. And I don't know what's going to happen after that. So, all right, let's go back to here. Oh, wait, you both already asked questions, so go over here. I'll come back to you, but. Okay. Uh, my name is Vince, and I have two questions. Uh, Republic or Empire? <laughs> <laughs> both. Oh. <laughs> Right. I'm not a competitive person. I, I hate competition. Um, uh, and so I, I just love to enjoy the experience with friends, and I, I, I play both sides. Okay, cool. But my main is Sith, if that makes you happy. Yes. Okay. Um, and then my second question is, uh, so back in October, Battlefield 3 was released with Battlelog. Uh, do you think more games will come out using that, that type of uh, social networking? So... Um, as far as my FPS experience goes, uh, I play a few, and my friends call me Meat Shield. Um, I, I actually, can you tell me what Battle Log is? Uh, it is essentially Facebook with Battlefield. So do you, you play in Facebook, or do you, like, as you're playing Battlefield, you can post stuff to Facebook? Uh, I think they're, <laughs> they're integrating that. Uh, I don't know if they have already. Um, but uh, essentially, if you play for X amount of hours, get this gun, people can hoo -ah that up and, and you know write comments and stuff okay. like that. I got it. Um, I, I think games are going in that direction. I mean, I, I think what's happening is the industry is realizing, oh my god, we are staying at home by ourselves playing video games instead of going out and making healthy social relationships. We need to fix this. And so games are starting to, to get more show, social. They're trying to get other people to connect and share in the enjoyment of things they do. Like, I mean, I could play 600 hours of Skyrim, but it doesn't mean anything to anyone who doesn't play Skyrim. Whereas if it was connected to Facebook and people can see my character, my armor, a list of all the cool things I've done and things like that, now it has a bit more weight, a bit more meaning, and it's something that I can talk about with people outside of the game. It allows me to connect with other people, and that makes me enjoy the product more. And so having the ability to do that is something that I think a lot of games are going. In fact, the, the MMO I mentioned earlier, Allods, um, actually has a, a Facebook link to it. So as I'm playing and doing things, I can take screenshots and post them directly to Facebook. As I reach achievements, I can send them directly from the game. And uh, it actually makes the experience a lot more fun because I feel like I d when I do something, I'm not just sharing it with the other eight nerds I have on Ventrilo. I'm sharing it with Facebook, and my mom can be all proud of me, even though she doesn't understand it. <laughs> uh, but she understands Farmville, so, you know, so I got that. But I, I really think that it's a direction that, A, needs to happen, and B, is, um, is happening in a very powerful way. So, all right. Oh, wait, does anyone in this side have, no, still in the dark? No? Okay. So I wanted to stem off of a little bit what Michael was saying. Um, okay. Do you see any possibility of like the social media space starting to emulate the AAA space as it becomes more profitable? Like, do you see like Gears of War for Facebook or something? I do. Okay. Um, I Is that think a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I think when games started for us, we were not playing Gears of War. We were playing Donkey Kong and Jumpman and you know, all these very simple, casual games. And we were trained over time to get into the games that we play now, the, you know, massively complex style of games. And I think the same thing is happening to the social media space, just faster. So, um, you know, with, the, with just the speed of growth and complexity from, um, from the first social games to where they are now, I, I do think that's going to happen. 
but I don't think it's going to go exactly the same way. I think it's still going to have, at its root, a social game with all this awesome stuff on top of it. And I think console games are doing the same thing. They're getting more social, but um, they're still staying with their root of being you know, the console style of game. Um, and with all the, like I said earlier, all the streaming stuff that's coming out, it's, it's very likely that you'll start seeing a lot more of this easily in the next few years. Um, and, and I think that'd be fantastic. So, good. You kind of stole my question. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to ask you the same thing I ask pretty much everyone I meet from anyone who plays and stuff like that. Is the How many of us have you met? <laughs> well, I asked Greg this, actually, and he gave me the opposite answer that you just gave. Okay. Sticking, about ah. the growth of simulation games and styles like that. Like, if you look at, if you extrapolate from, like, the first Bejeweled to where it is now and how many features and modes and things like it, it has, yet it's still considered a casual game, whereas I guarantee if we got half of these core players to try it, they'd get their butts kicked by their moms. Um, it, it's yeah. something where it's growing in a Which state. is an incredibly humbling thing, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is, like, we have these city bills and we have these simulation genre style games in a genre that's been considered dormant or dead for a long time. If, if not for Maxis recently announcing the new SimCity, you would have s assumed it was a dead genre. But do you think that with this growth that we could see our moms playing like Dwarf Fortress in 10 years? Like um, I don't know if I'd want to see that in particular. <laughs> she talks to me enough as it is. Um, I, think, I think that games will continue to grow in complexity and they will find a nice place where the complexity matches the desires of the market. Um, as we start playing more social games and we start putting money into social games, then more games that are targeted to us will start coming out on, on, on Facebook and or you know other social media platforms. So if you know when we you know age 20 years from now and our kids are are playing Dwarf Fortress on Facebook, it'll be there because there's money in there for those people. Um, that game is insane, by the way. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't understand. Anyway. Uh, um, but, oh yeah, you know, your dwarf has been murdered by an evil demon. Pay $5 now and you can oh, echo. Um, so, but yeah, so I, I, I do think that, that games will follow where people want them to be. And I think that as the market continues to grow, as people stop feeling like social games are the evil empire, um, you'll start seeing more games targeted towards us because we will be putting money into the system. Do you think that from the, the mothers playing Cityville, though, will there gain a niche of those who want deeper and more complex mechanics? Yeah, definitely. Not just us getting into those games, like they themselves. Yeah, no, I, I don't think my mother will play Dwarf Fortress, but I, I could see her playing um, you know, like, uh, like Psychonauts, you know, that, that with enough um, enriching, or probably more towards MMOs. Because you know, the, all the mechanics and social games are the ones that are in MMOs, but they've just added complexity in, in combat, complexity in movement, complexity in, um, well, that's really about it, actually, now that I think about it, uh, well, you know, grouping and things like that. But um, I can see a very easy progression from, from um, you know, Cityville and Gardens of Time and you know the other the the big hits that are on Facebook now into like okay let's add a little bit more and then six months later another one comes out adds a little bit more that it would it would move towards something like that and and yes you could be raiding with your mom who would ground you because you're up to late and you're you're up really late and not healing her like she needs so <laughs> I think we have time for one or two more questions so uh, anybody want to yay in the dark okay. Harrison? Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you say social games are more profitable than mobile app games? Um, hmm. Because I think the two are so closely connected at this point, I'm not sure if that's still a, a valid thing to look at. And even in the terms of how they're developed is very, very similar. I would say that they're, they're I would say social media um, on Facebook and things like that is probably slightly more profitable at the moment, but both of those industries are booming. Um, and both are great avenues to start getting into game development. In fact, things like developing on the, on the Android or on the, the um, Blackberry playbook, um, the, the entrance fee is very cheap to free. The, you, know, you get the source code, for, or you get the SDKs for free and everything like that. So uh, it's giving 
independent developer is a great avenue to, to hit a market that's still in the stage where indie games are just as good, um, or at least close enough to the power of you know, some of the big ma uh, major competitors in the field. So um, it's really hard to say, in, in my opinion, in my um, understanding of, of mobile, since I'm not as connected to it as I am in the social space, but I, I do know that it's growing and it's successful. And um, it, it's kind of a, a preference, I think, at this point. So All right, do we have time for one more? OK. Well, anyone else? <laughs> I don't want to talk about Dwarf. I don't want to talk about Dwarf Fortress anymore. <laughs> All right, go ahead. My name is John Hahn, and uh, kind of piggybacking off of something that Tyler said over there. Okay. And, uh, kind of like <laughs> so, so you're Tyler? Not exactly. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> kind of like how he said, like some hardcore games that would be on like a console, like would transfer over to Facebook. I sure. Know if something like um, would a Facebook game transfer over to a console? Um, that's a that's a good question. I I think if it does happen, it will be rare, because of the fact that you look at market share in terms of um, in terms of outreach Facebook having 300 million something active users on it means that I've I've got an install base of that size that if I put something out there I can reach 300 million people whereas if I put something on the console we're in the you know the double the low double digits uh, in the millions of, of people so I can reach you know 5 million 10 million people and so it seems like it might not be the best plan. However, a game that does happen to really take off on Facebook and demonstrates that it would actually be a viable product on in the you know in the Xbox or PlayStation downloadable for example could be a viable market to go. Like um, Cannibal. I can see that you know moving towards Xbox or or PlayStation that well there you go. Um, it's going on the Vita too, isn't it? Yeah, so um, it, it's essentially down to the product. What, what's a good idea, and will this work in this market? And if it is, well, let's do it and see what happens. But console, also to develop for a console, you're paying ridiculous amounts of money just to prove that you have a chance of hopefully trying to develop a game on that console. It, the, the licensing problem is, is ridiculously insane. But, um, but there are games that do that, and, and I think there probably will be a few who continue to do that. It's just not... It, it's only a good idea if you think that you'll be successful there. So, all right, I think that's it. Yes, so please come to your room. And he's going to be around afterwards. He's going to be here kind of for the next few days, and he's going to be doing some portfolio reviews as well. Isn't that right? So, I think so. Yes, so if you're interested in doing that, um, talk to Nell Graves or email her if you're interested in him looking over your stuff. Um, feel free to throw your um, feedback cards up here. We'll be drawing at the end of the day. And